Um, I, wishful thinking. I thought I'd start with this um, because obviously the organizers in choosing the date 2084 were thinking of 1984 from George Orwell. And a lot of this is going to um, basically involve my speech. Now, this is the Dalai Lama. Now, it's a very encouraging message, but actually I think it's total dreamland. It is not going to work. I'm going to talk about the evolution of conflict. And I think it's worth thinking about what the world was like in 1984. And the fact is that we basically were in a Cold War. And this was what really threatened us. Ultimate destruction through a Holocaust in which you put, pitted the Soviet Union versus the United States and the West in general. If you go back to 1984, it was the year of the Los Angeles Olympics. But actually, Russia and the Soviet bloc did not turn up. Now, we shouldn't actually have been surprised because uh, in 1983, one year earlier, Ronald Reagan had described the Soviet Union as the evil empire. Now, most of you here were, of course, not alive in 1984. <laughs> but we actually did have a right to be afraid. There are, at the moment, 15,000, just over 15,000 nuclear warheads in existence. And maybe, thanks to uh, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump, although I have my doubts, the number will go down just a smidgen. But the fact is that during the Cold War, various parts of the Cold War, the number of nuclear weapons was between 60,000 and 70,000. We had a real right to be scared. I think because um, of this idea of mutually assured destruction, the West and the Soviet bloc never came directly to blows. But did that mean that the world as a whole was at peace? No, it didn't. If you take the single year 1984, in Afghanistan, you had Soviet troops fighting against the Mujahideen. Mujahideen were the Muslim guerrillas who included Osama bin Laden. And who financed them, who organized them, who supplied them? It was the United States and Saudi Arabia. And so you see the roots of today's problems go way back. Now, that was in Afghanistan. What about Lebanon? Lebanon, which is where we used to live, in 1984, it was the ninth year of its civil war. And there were still another six to go. In uh, Iraq and Iran, there was a war going on in the fourth year, with another four still to go. Uh, Sri Lanka, it was the first year of the civil war. But actually, the Sri Lankan government was not able to uh, claim victory until 2009. So that was then. It was not a terribly good period. Now, where are we now? Well, in some ways, 2018, 34 years after Orwell's rather dystopian village, uh, vision of 1984, where we are now is actually much, much better. In the first decade of this century, the number of deaths from war-related reasons was about 55,000 a year. Now, that seems a lot. But compare it with 180,000 a year during the Cold War, and compare it with at least 10 million a year during the Second World War. I mean, the fact is that we as a race are killing fewer people in conflict than at any time in the last 100 years. Well, that's, I suppose, uh, an encouraging sign. Is there anything else we encouraged about? Yes. If you go back to 1960, when none of you were born, although I was, um, you'll find that the world then had about three billion people. Now, of those three billion, at least half were living in what the UN defines as extreme poverty. If you go forward to now, the world's population is about 7.6 billion. And the number of people living in extreme poverty, which the UN defines as living on $1.90 a day, is actually fewer than 10%. I mean, the fact is that we are healthier, we are wealthier, we are longer lived than ever before, and we're killing fewer people than ever before. So, what is there to worry about? Well, maybe quite a bit. I mean, the fact is that there is another Cold War happening. And Sergei Lavrov, the uh, long-standing, long-serving 
uh, Russian foreign minister, says that this Cold War is actually worse than the previous Cold War. Well, in which case, what's to stop it from becoming a hot Cold War? Well, if you look at this graph here, you'll see that actually states no longer really go to war with each other. The red line is the one to pay attention to. It's basically at zero. States do not fight other states now. The one exception I can think of in this century is when Russia came to blows with Georgia in 2008. And that was a war, won of course by Russia, uh, which lasted for a mere five days. When states go to war now, they go to war with non-state actors, for example, the Taliban in Afghanistan, or with ISIS in the Middle East, or with Boko Haram in Nigeria. And uh, one reason they go to war, uh, with, not with each other, I mean, there are several reasons. Some people say it's because there are more democracies, and democracies don't fight each other. I'm not entirely convinced by that argument. I think it's because, actually, it's easier to fight wars by proxy. If you look at, the, at Syria, for example, the West, basically, and most of the Arab world, for that matter, wanted to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. And so they support the uh, fighters against Bashar. Russia intervened in 2015 to make sure that Bashar stays in power. Who will win? Well, I think Bashar will certainly stay in power, for better or for worse. But that's not really the point. The fact is that wars now are happening in a way that uh, involves states, but only by proxy. Now, if you think of this, these are drones. Now, how much does a drone cost? Well, actually, I have no idea, because I've never bought one. But I do know that I could actually afford one. Now, why would a, 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 a government anymore invest in expensive aircraft carriers, incredibly expensive jet fighters, why not actually just employ drones? They're cheap, they're disposable. And this, I think, is one of the futures of war. It will be increasingly robotic. The other th thing to bear in mind is cyber warfare. Why invest in huge armed forces when actually you can cause far more damage by using your computer, even a lonely teenager? I don't want to think of any of the, the guys from this school, but one can imagine some lonely guy sitting in front of his computer, and of course it is normally guys rather than girls, uh, and paralyzing a health system, or paralyzing uh, a state's financial system, or its power supply. So cyber warfare is here to stay, and it will get worse. Now, that's where we are at the moment. Where are we going to be in 2084? 100 years from the Orwell date. Well, for one thing, the population of the world will be much larger. It will be a bit over 10 billion. And there will be added pressures from climate change. There will also be advances from science in technology, producing things which we can barely imagine, and in fact, surely things which, which we have not imagined at all. I mean, maybe Elon Musk has, but most of us will not have. Now, all that will be new. It will bring new pressures. But one thing that will not change is human nature. We will still have the same emotions. We'll have hatred. We'll have lust. We'll have happiness. We'll have joy, jealousy, all those feelings that we all experience, and which mankind has always experienced and which I think mankind will still experience in 2084. Now, what is the implication of that? The implication, I think, is that um, we will still have conflict. Now, in the early 90s, an American political scientist called Samuel Huntington uh, wrote about the clash of civilizations. Now, let's think about that idea. By 2084, you could well have a clash between China, the People's Republic, and the United States of America. Now, if that happens, it'll actually be a classic case of what other political scientists call the Thucydides trap. Now, the idea is that an existing superpower, in this case, 
US, United States, gets trapped into conflict, gets lured into conflict with an emerging superpower, in this case, China. Now, Thucydides wrote about this two and a half thousand years ago. At the time, the superpower was Sparta, and the emerging power was Athens. And for some reason, because I haven't read Thucydides, although I should have, I did classics at school, um, it, they could not come to an agreement to live together. And so instead, they had 30 years of the Peloponnesian War. Now, is that going to happen with USA and China? It could. Some people think it definitely will. It's something we should certainly bear in mind. But that wasn't particularly on Huntington's mind. What he said was definite was a war between the West and Islam. Now, this is a rather dangerous concept, but if you were a Muslim, you could quite easily conclude that the West really is waging a war against Islam. You think of Western intervention in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, and then you get a reaction. Now, this is the flag, as you know, of the Islamic State of ISIS. La ilaha illallah, Allah, Rasul, Muhammad. And I don't think that more than a very small percentage, very small percentage of Muslims actually sympathize with Islamic State. But nonetheless, the idea of a clash of civilizations shouldn't be dismissed because one thing leads to another. We all like to think that, um, that we belong to a certain group. We need an identity. Most of the time, our identity is our nationality, or it can be our ethnicity, or our education, or our social class. Uh, it can even be our football team. In my case, perhaps sadly, it's Arsenal. And the point about, the point about having um, this identity is that it gives us an anchor in a globalized world. And we need that anchor, because otherwise the globalized world becomes too confusing. But the problem with having these identities is that there's always the risk that one identity will clash with another and that you will then have conflict. Well, what sort of conflict could that be? I've mentioned robotic warfare, cyber warfare. But actually, if you think ahead, there are much more dangerous prospects. I mean, in a way, I suppose nuclear holocaust, nuclear uh, weapons are becoming a bit passe. But think of the potential of chemical weapons and biological weapons. Think of the potential of artificial intelligence. We're already, 2018, on the cusp, thanks to artificial intelligence and of the brilliant brains that are involved in this, of creating weapons that will be able to identify and select their own targets and then destroy those targets without any human intervention. It is actually a very, very scary thought. Well, how do we avoid that? Well, I think the only way really is to change governments. But, and I think one reason, thing to bear in mind is that you know, governments need to realize that whereas in the past, the impact of, law, of war was local. Now, oops, sorry, this has gone too far, the impact is actually international. The United Nations calculates that there are now 65 million people in the world who have been forcibly displaced from their homes. That doesn't include economic migrants. And it calculates that that number is going up by one person every three seconds. So, I, I don't have the maths, but if you think of the number that's going to increase today, it's pretty large. Now, how do we stop that? How do we reverse those numbers? Well, as I said, we need to change governments. We need to, governments that are no longer corrupt. We need governments that are no longer ineffective. Well, can we do that? Frankly, I have my doubts. There was a uh, historian, A.J.P. Taylor, British historian, who said, whatever the political reasons are given for war, the underlying reason 
is always economic. Now, if you bear that in mind and then look at this particular slide, the bottom segment of that pyramid in blue, that is 70% of the world's population, the world's adult population. And the amount of the world's wealth that it controls, this is according to Credit Suisse, is 2.7%. Now, if you go to the very top of the pyramid, the yellow point, that reflects uh, a population of 0.7% of the world's adults. How much of the world's wealth do they control? According to Credit Suisse, it's 45.9%. Now, it seems to me that history shows that when you have economic disparities that are so great, and it lasts so long, then the pyramid crumbles, and it crumbles through war. So I think that in the future, we are going to have plenty of revolutionary moments and revolutionary movements. And the powerful do not always win. The history of warfare, if you take, for example, asymmetric warfare, is that you know, David slew Goliath. The Viet Cong beat the Americans in Vietnam. You know, in the end, the, the powerful are dispossessed. Things change. So that is what I think is likely to happen. I think we are in for, well, your grandchildren. Not, I hope you. I hope you all live in peace. Let me give you a final thought, which is, if you like, the opposite of the Dalai Lama's thought. Um, the fact is that I, maybe a lot of you do meditate, but I think most people do not meditate, and they won't meditate. They have other things to do in their life. And so the Dalai Lama's vision that we will somehow take violence away from the world simply will not happen. Instead, Rutherford B. Hayes, in the 19th century, said, I think, something which is absolutely true. Wars will remain while human nature remains. I believe in my soul in cooperation, in arbitration. That's what we all do as civilized human beings. But the soldier's occupation, we cannot say, is gone until human nature is gone. Well, human nature is not gone, and it will not be gone. I think George Santayana said this whole thing rather more succinctly when he said, only the dead have seen the end of war. Thank you very much.